family here safe. And um, there, there was a few instances where um, it was just, uh, we had heard about some things that really um, Sadie and I didn't have a piece about. And if um, you know the people coming out, you know, please keep me in your prayers. And if you know that they're doing things that um, would endanger Sadie and I or others or our church family, that's not gossip at all, just um, letting us know. Um, so we're, we're just asking you to, to do that, like, hey, um, you know, we want to be, uh, the Word of God says, um, uh, what is it, Dennis? Wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Amen. So we do want to minister to the lost, and at, at the same time, we're certainly not going to jeopardize any of the sheep doing that. So we just want to give you a report on what's going on. Um, we had a real big crowd uh, Friday. And um, we're just so pleased that the, the Spirit of God has had a free course. And, and we're praying for others to come out. There's a whole group of parents, husbands and wives, that their husband or wife is using, uh, the kids are using. And we want to minister to heartbroken parents as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we're ready, willing, and able to do that. We have some elders here at the church that are coming out that are, are, are seasoned believers and um, you know just to, they just want to you know love on people and, and encourage them and uh, we uh, just pray that others would come out we thank you we continue to thank you for letting us have that here on Friday so, God bless your your fall season <laughs> I hope to stay warm <laughs> anybody else <clears throat> Wednesday night, but uh, we were praying for a little girl. Her name was Allie, and she had cancer. And it was pretty serious for her because she's also had, I think, a heart transplant is what she's been through. But she's only 11 to 12 years old, um, so it's a serious situation for her. But I'm happy to report the Lord has answered our prayer. She is completely free of cancer. She's in the middle of, or really at the end of, her very last treatment. She had to go in the hospital Thursday for five more days. So uh, tomorrow, I guess, she gets out. But doing well, so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. I'd also like to have you pray for, uh, I'm not going to get this name right, Persephone? Yes, Persephone. Uh, Evelyn. Yes. She, she's the, the lady across the street from us. Uh, it's her daughter's. Uh, child, a young lady who's in the Marine Corps, and uh, she, I don't think she's married, but anyway, make a long story short, she was born with her intestines on the outside. And I can't remember, she, she gave me a name of the disease. The reason I found out this stuff was because she asked me if I would uh, trade some chickens, I guess it was, chicken breasts and stuff like that, and meat for uh, cutting up the wood. Well, I'm not going to take any of her stuff, but we're going to we're going to cut her wood up. Anyway, one, one thing led to another. I told her that day, she's not a Christian. As I asked her, I said, you a Christian? And she just stood there and looked at me. And I said, that's all right. That's all right. You're right around. I said, we're taking, you know, your granddaughter's name before the church Wednesday night. And we're going to bring her up for prayer. So if you would think of her and think of Teresa. Teresa works over the two Bayside. Anna would know her. Teresa would know Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, pray for her. Her for her salvation and her daughter's salvation and her daughter's, uh, or the baby's father's salvation. And most of all, the, the, the little uh, Persephone makes it through these operations. She's, she's been there since father's day. They were from Harrington originally, I think. She did work from Harrington originally. Yeah. The girl went to marriage right the, the mother of his child. Yeah, so if, you, if your folks would do that, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. And before the kids go down, I, I have five of them that have learned all their ten verses. They've earned a prize today. They want to get up. All right, well, we'll turn the radio over to Lord Joni then. We have all five of you. Dennis, Bella, Joe, Joshi, no, she's one of I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin 
He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Very good. Jeremiah 18, 6. Behold, the clay is in the potter's hand, so are we in my hands. Okay. And Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Mark 16, 15. Go into the world, the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. And the last one, uh, Psalm 56, 8. What time I am afraid. Uh, you may not have known this, but uh, there's an election coming up. <laughs> you didn't know. Um, I, I have asked for, from the Christian Civic League, some uh, voter guides. I don't know that we really need them, but uh, more that maybe you want to share them. So um, I'm not sure when I'll get them, but they'll be available the next couple of weeks. But also wanted to mention there is a place, it's uh, iVoterGuide. Um, let me see exactly what it says. iVoterGuide.com is another place. This is a voter guide that's grounded in God, rooted in research. And so it's a place where you can look and see where candidates stand on issues that are important to us as Christians. So. Um, I actually have a flyer. I meant to make some copies of it. Maybe I'll do that for next week, too. But there are plenty of resources out there, and it is important to know where the candidates stand and to vote biblically. That's important. Um, as far as where the candidates stand, there is a, a debate Tuesday night, we think. Uh, jury's still out on that one, because a lot of people don't believe it'll happen. But I, I think where they're still planning to hold it in two days, that perhaps it will happen. And I hope that many people do tune in, because I think uh, there will be more clarity. Though I, I'm not sure how many people are really up in the air still. The other thing, as you know, I'm sure, uh, Amy Coney Barrett was nominated for the Supreme Court. Uh, she's a, a Catholic lady, which is fine by me. It's going to be interesting to see how they attack her, though, since Nancy Pelosi is a Catholic and Joe Biden is a Catholic. They all, and yet, they, it seems that they want to attack her because of her faith. Um, we know they have the votes. We know that she will be ultimately a Supreme Court justice. But I'm just concerned again about what kind of a a crazy process we're going to go through until she gets there. It was certainly difficult going through the Matt Kavanaugh um, process, uh, his, his time before Congress. And, and I just think, I, I hope that the Lord uses this to expose the hearts of those that are opposed to the gospel um, because there is opposition to the gospel. There certainly is. All that to say that we need to be praying. We need to be people of prayer. And I, I know we are. Um, and that's actually what we're going to be talking about this morning. Because that's where we are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're, 
we're on the topic of prayer. This is what Paul, as we begin here, he's asking for prayer. It's something he does regularly, seeking prayer. And so, the importance of prayer, and certainly in our day and age, certainly where we live right now. So let's pray about these things, and Lord, we, we do thank you for the time that we can gather to be in your word. We thank you, Lord, that we live in a country where your word does have free course. And uh, as John said, though, we, we want to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. And we just pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom as we engage in our, with our friends, with our family, with our neighbors. Lord, help us to do it with civility, but also with uh, truth and with wisdom. And we do pray, Lord, for our leaders. We pray, Lord, that you give us godly leadership. Because we know that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And we desire, Lord, that we would have righteous leaders. And so we pray with the election coming up that you would grant that request. We also pray for Amy Barrett as she's facing a tough couple of weeks. We pray that you would strengthen her, that you would give her wisdom. And Lord, I don't know if she's saved or not. I know she has a faith to some degree, certainly through the church. But I pray that she is a Christian lady and that she looks to you for wisdom and guidance and that you would strengthen and bless her and her family during this time of crazy, uh, oh, just all the investigation they're going to do and all the, the lies that I suspect will come up. I just pray, Lord, that she would stand strong through it all. And Lord, we, we thank you for your word as we turn to it now. As we look into your word, we pray you would look into our hearts and see if there be any wicked way in us. And Lord, that you would expose it, bring it to light, lead us into confessing it, and set us free from the power of bondage, Lord. Bless our time in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So Paul, you know, he's reassured the Thessalonians that they had missed the rapture. We talked about that last week. And wanted them to know, certainly, that God loves them. God's for them. He's on their side. And so Paul here, he begins to close out the letter. And he begins that with this prayer request. As we Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, finally, brethren, pray for us. That the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified. Just as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith. What a great prayer for Paul to ask them to pray for him. You see, Paul understood the importance of prayer. He understood the power available through prayer. And I think that we all intellectually will agree that there is power in prayer. And yet I think too often... We still, I, I speak for me, I still rely on my own resources instead of just praying, spending time in prayer. If we really understand how important it is and how powerful it is to pray, I think we would pray without ceasing, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. And I think that's where the Lord wants us to be. And that knowledge that He is present, that He is with us, and that we can call upon Him at any time and He hears us. And that He wants that kind of relationship with us, where we can communicate, and where He can lead and guide us. I think we know that, and yet, I, you know, what I, I desire to do is encourage all of you to come and join us Wednesday night when we do pray as a group. Um, I think it's important that we do that, critically important, because we can pray individually, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's important that we do do that, but it's interesting how much more powerful and how much more impactful it is when we pray corporately. Uh, Levitica, Leviticus 26, verse 8, it talks about this. It says, five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemy shall fall before you by the sword. And I just think, I'm meditating on that verse, that particular verse, 
uh, yesterday and, uh, and before that a little bit too, but I was doing that math. You know, if five chases a hundred, right, that's, so that means one gets 20. You know, I like to do math right now, it's simple, right? But then you go with, well, we have more than five of us, we have a hundred of us, we can put 10,000 to flight. Well, that means for each one, it's a hundred. So you see how things increase numerically as we gather together, as we join our voices together and pray. And that's why the importance of corporate prayer. Uh, it cannot be overstated. It is critical. It's multiplied power. I don't know how that works. I'd like to explain it to you, how if one of us prays, we have this much power, but two, it goes that much further. You get to five, it's greater. Then you get a hundred, it's even huge, you know. How does that work? I don't know. But I know it does work because it says so. Leviticus 26, 8 says so. Five of you chase a hundred, but a hundred put 10,000 to flight. And then your enemies shall fall before you. We have enemies. You know that. We do have enemies. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Though this is our enemies. You know, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Too often it, it breaks down into a, a personal attack, or it can, and, and we see that certainly in the political climate of our day, where there is so much. I see it constantly. People will attack our president, not on his policies. They don't talk about his policy. They always want to talk about his person, who he is. Now, he is not the Pope. He is not a religious leader. That's not who he is. I wish he was. That would be great. The perfect leader that we're ever going to get is Jesus Christ when he comes to rule and reign. That's when we get perfection. We're not going to have a perfect leader. And Donald Trump is not one. However, his policies are for life, for religious liberty, for smaller government, reduced taxes, for the empowerment of the people. How can we dispute that? See, and they can. People cannot. So they attack him personally. And that's what those who are opposed to the church do the same thing. They attack us personally. They don't have anything. They can't stand against what we believe. Or they can try to, but they're not successful, I guess. But see, understand that each of our enemies, though, has behind them. There is a, a demon, a devil. There is a principality. There is a power. There is a, a spiritual force that's influencing and, and really disrupting our nation right now, for sure. And so it's critically important especially over the next five, six, seven weeks, probably through the end of the year, because it's going to be crazy, I think, in America. It's important that we pray, that we set aside time every day to pray. I'm probably preaching to the choir, but if you're not doing that, please do that. Please, in this time especially, because as we do that, as we pray, God will move. It moves the hand of God when we pray. He hears us. And he does that. And the other thing I want to point out from that verse in Leviticus 26, 80. Not only can five chase a hundred and a hundred put ten thousand to flight and your enemies fall before you, but how do they fall? It's by the sword. Still in Ephesians 6, which I moved away from, but Verse 17, it says, And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, our sword is not a metal implement for slashing people. You know, it's not that we cut people up. Our sword is the Word of God. It's His Word. It's knowing His Word. It's critically important that we know His Word. And as Paul finished this, list of our spiritual armor saying to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is our offensive weapon. It's 
That's what it is. And the sword is God's word. And with that, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What do we do with it? How do we pray? We pray in accordance with God's word. And we pray his word even. It's a good thing to do, to pray his word. Hebrews 4.12, you're familiar with that verse as well, talking about the word of God. It is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit. And of joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So we think of the power and the precision of the word of God. It is powerful. And it is precise. And it does cut. And it does, as in Isaiah it says, God's word does not go forth except to accomplish the purpose that he has for it to accomplish. God has a purpose in his word, and it's important to use his word as we pray. And it's important to pray. Again, Paul constantly asked for prayer, and I, I have a bunch of verses where he did that. Romans 15, 30, where he asked for prayer. 2 Corinthians 1, 11, where we just were in Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. Philippians 1, 19. Colossians 4.13, 1 Thessalonians 5.25, Philemon 1.22, and right here. So eight different times where he said, pray for me. And we need to lift each other up in prayer. We need to do that. Brethren, pray for us. That the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified. So he wants God's word. That's the prayer that God's word would be free to do its work. That it would be unhindered. And so important that we do this. And especially right now. So many churches are still closed. Isn't that amazing to think? So many pastors have stood up against it. And as they stand up against it, the, the law has nothing it can do. And yet there are many who will attack the church right now, saying that they don't care about this virus that is running through our land. And that's not true either. We do have to be wise. We have to be careful. Many churches, uh, talking with a friend the other day, they, they church, they allow 50 in at a time. And 50 can be in a, another room because they have the space where they can observe from afar. So they get 100, pers 100 people a service. So they're doing what they can to comply with the governor's wishes. But we need to gather. We need to be together. And we need to pray. Because the churches are closed. And even when they're open, there's so much apathy. So many people that go to church just to go to church. Just, uh, I don't know, makes them feel good or something. Why do we go to church? What's our purpose in being here and gathering, right? It's to get equipped, it's to get strengthened, it's to get unified. Because when we leave here and we go out there, they want to beat us up. There are devils and demons and, and, and these people that are influenced by them that want to tear us down, want to discourage us and disappoint us and depress us and all these things. And, and our purpose in gathering, hopefully anyway, is to be built up, to be encouraged, to be strengthened one with another. So we ask prayer that the word may run swiftly and that it may be glorified. You know, that it, uh, that it would be exalted. God's word would have the importance it should have in our nation, in our culture, in our, our neighborhoods, and even in our own lives. That it would be believed upon and applied. We not only need to believe it is God's word, but we need to look at it and let it reflect back on us. And say, oh, your word says I should do this, but that is what I'm going to do. To be obedient to what the word says. And then Paul here, he also asks that they pray, verse 2, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. You know, and it is right to pray against wicked and unreasonable people. There are wicked and unreasonable people. But how do we pray for them? We want them to be saved. We want them to come to a knowledge of the truth. As Ben and I were talking before the service, 
We prayed for Barack Obama when he was president. We didn't like him being president. I didn't agree with many of his policies. But what's the greatest thing if he had gotten saved? For our governor, I don't believe she's a woman of faith. You want to change her policies? You change her Lord. You know, if she were to get saved, what an awesome thing that would be. And so it isn't necessarily we pray doom and gloom on someone. Be like uh, James and John. Shall we call them fire on them, Lord, and toast them? You know, it's not that. We don't want ill will for anyone. We want them to know there is a God who loves them. We want them to know that there's a better way. And it's God's way. <laughs> Our unreasonable people. You don't have to watch the news very long right now. You hear a whole pile of them. You know, it's amazing. They're burning down cities. Yeah, that's right. I didn't like his policies much, but I didn't burn down Jonesboro. Exactly. You know? Burning down the rioting, the looting, the ungodliness, the lawlessness. It's insane. The Marxist ideology. Coming out of our colleges and universities. That's where a lot of it has come from. And they want to destroy. Why do they want to destroy America? You know, with the... It's amazing when you think about our nation. Because we have the power that we could dominate the world. We do. We could. But see, that's not who we are as a people. We have, or at least we were founded on, the principle of serving, not lording it over. It's Christian ideals. That's the foundation of who we are. Any other nation with the power that we have, they would bring everybody else into subservient status. That's the goal of China. Everybody talks Russia, 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 right? Well, the issue is China people, <laughs> you know? You're looking in the wrong place. And everyone wants to attack our president, thinking he should have done better with this COVID issue. Why are we not attacking China? That's where it came from. And that's what the devil does. He deflects. He wants to put the emphasis on where he can cause the most divisiveness. That's why the riots... Because of systemic racism. I just don't believe there's systemic racism. Is there racism? Yes. But does it permeate our culture? No. Not anymore. It used to. But they're looking for... They, they have nothing with which to fight, so they create an agenda to fight over it. That's the way it seems to me. It's tragic when anyone dies. But to blame these servants of the people, the police officers, not that they're all perfect, they're men, they're women, they make mistakes, they do things wrongly at times. And those that are pointing their finger at them ought to first do life perfectly themselves. If there is an injustice, we have laws. They will be tried. That's the way we, we are governed by the rule of law. And that's the problem that we have right now, is lawlessness. It's a crazy time in which we live. And I can see why, and that's where, I mean, remember in Thessalonica, these folks were being attacked. They were being harmed greatly. There were many unreasonable and ungodly people in their neighborhoods. And Paul is saying the answer to that, though, is to pray. Pray for deliverance. And then he said, you know, verse 3 here, he said, but the Lord is faithful. See, he's saying, even if you don't pray, that's how I take that. Even if you don't pray, the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning both that you do and will do the things we command you. He said, look, you need to pray. But even if you're not, even if men are not faithful to pray, God is still faithful. 
And then what I get out of that myself, you know, is that God wants us engaged in working together with him for the advancement of his kingdom. That's what he wants. And when we do that, he rewards us for our labor in him. You know, it isn't like the Lord is hindered by our faithlessness. If we neglect to pray that somehow the, the plan and the purpose of God is going to be thwarted, that isn't going to happen. God's will will be done. But he wants us to be a part of what he's doing. He wants us to pray. He wants us to join. And he does protect us from the evil one. He does that. Who will establish you and he will guard you from the evil one. You remember in Job, in Job chapter 1, where the devil went and was before the Lord and he said, have you, the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? What a great guy he is. And all these things that God is praising Job for the way he lived his life. And the devil said, well, the problem is you put this hedge around him. You're protecting him. So I can't get at him. That's so encouraging to me. Because if he was doing it for Job, guess what? He's doing it for us. God protects us. He's guarding us. And that's a comforting thought. God's got it. And then he says in verse 4, We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that both that you do and will do the things we command you. So Paul here is expressing his confidence in their obedience. See, God's work of guarding us from the evil one is done to the degree that we're willing to submit and obey him. That's the point he's making. And as you submit and you obey him, it makes it easier for God to guard us. We fall in under this umbrella of protection that God has for us. But if we reject God, if we push him away, if we're resisting him, then there are consequences to that. And with that will come doubt. Is God allowing this in my life because I have resisted him, because I have rejected him, because I have fallen into sin? Those doubts will come. Those questions will come. And yet, when we're obedient, we have a confidence. Regardless of the, the circumstance that comes at us, <clears throat> the circumstance we find ourselves in, Regardless of that, I know that I'm in the will of the Lord, and for whatever reason God is allowing this in my life, I will accept it. And there's a great peace that comes in that, with obedience. And that's why, and Paul said, I know you guys, I have confidence in the Lord concerning you guys, not both that you do it and you will do the things we command you. And then, in verse 5, Paul prays for them again. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. He prays for them. These two things, the love of God and the patience of Christ. To know for certain of God's great love for them and for the endurance as they go through the trials and the persecutions they're experiencing. The love of God. We know that God loves us. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, right? John 3, 16. We know this. God's great love for us. And the Lord, that's his prayer. May the Lord direct your hearts into that, into that knowledge of his great love for us, but also because of the trials that we're going through, into the patience of Christ. I hadn't really thought much about the patience of Christ before. But think of how patient he had to be. You know where he came from. He came from heaven. He's the Lord from heaven. And he came down here to this earth that's quite a fall down. That's a big step to go from there to here. And then he's born as a baby and he has to live on this planet 30 years, just quietly. That's a lot of patience, 30 years before his ministry started. 30 years. And then he starts his public ministry. And you look at the guys that he surrounded himself with. He had that patience with those guys, too. You know, Peter, Cain, John, and the rest of them. You know, so he demonstrated patience. He did. 
So that's a great prayer, really. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. In the midst of trials, to realize that God loves us and that everything is for a season. Nothing lasts forever except forever. Forever with the Lord. That's what lasts forever. Well, from this point, as he's writing here, starting in verse 6, uh, we move into a section um, where Paul is instructing, or actually the Holy Spirit instructing the church, uh, giving them instructions for the strength and the purity of the church. That's what he's going on to do. And that's what we're going to go on to do next week, is, is look at those, because it's amazing how time flies when you're having a problem, you know? But I think it's a good place. I actually expected to get down a few more verses, but I don't want to shortchange this any either. But read ahead, because it's important. And you know, even this first command here, we'll talk about it next week, but we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul had boldness, didn't he? He knew that it was God who was speaking through him and he's commanding them. And what's the commandment? They withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. And so we're going to talk about, as we head toward the end of this letter, is the tradition of the apostles. Not my tradition, not your tradition, not man's tradition. But there is an apostolic tradition. And if someone is walking contrary to that, then we, we need to confront them to the degree that we let them know you're not walking right. We need to let them know that their walk with the Lord is not a walk with the Lord. <laughs> their walk is built on self, selfishness. And that they need to repent. And we'll, we'll deal with that. And there's other things beyond that that we'll deal with next week. For now, it's prayer. That's the emphasis for today. Encouraging you to be prayerful. And we need to pray. And so, why don't we stand? And I'll close in prayer. And then, Lord, give a song, maybe, that we'll, we'll end with. Before. We need to pull this down. Get yes, this all back on. Yeah, okay. And let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for your word and the truth of it. And Lord, as we've looked at this morning, <clears throat> the importance of prayer. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of your presence. Help us to be mindful of your purposes in the world around us. And help us, Lord, to lift up those that are in authority over us, especially as this election is coming up. Again, we pray, Lord, for godly leaders that would lead us back into the paths of righteousness. We are a sinful people. There is much wickedness and lawlessness going on in our land today. And Lord, we, we hate it. Lord, I, I, I hate as well this, this sin of abortion. Lord, I am so encouraged by this Supreme Court nominee. And I pray, Lord, that as I saw abortion legalized, as a young man, I pray I would see it outlawed as an older man. We pray, Lord, that that light on our nation, that sin that we have committed for all these years, would be eradicated. Oh, Lord, help us to repent as a people. Help us to turn back to you. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would have free course, your word would have free course, and that we'd see revival in our days as well, before you return to take us all out of here and to take us to live with you. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for their being here this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would fill them with your spirit, that you would bless them, and that as we go, you would go before us and give us opportunities to just share with others the joy that we know. Thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. With that.
Let's go and let's trust in him. God bless you all.